I want you guys to all imagine that you are living in a foreign country. You've left your family behind in New York. You're living alone. You don't speak the language in that country. You don't really understand their laws. You have no friends. You have no family. You have no identification. But you have to work to support yourself. There are thousands of things that could happen to you that could, hap that could go wrong. But you're afraid to report it because you don't want to get deported. You can't report it, you think, because you don't speak the language. Who do you go to? I am here as a prosecutor with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. As Father said, I am the director, one of two directors of the Immigrant Affairs Program in that office, um, where we protect the immigrant community. We create a safe environment for undocumented immigrants to come forward and to announce, I am a victim of a crime. Our policy is that we do not report undocumented immigrants to immigration for the purposes of deportation. Our policy is that if you are a victim of a crime, you have every right to walk through the district attorney's office's doors <coughs> as a citizen. If a victim stays silent, they remain victimized forever. My office has about 550 attorneys, making us one of the largest prosecutor offices in the country. How many of you guys watch Law and Order? You all know what a prosecutor does, right? Okay, good. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, with groups, I have to start from the basics. So our job is to advocate for victims. Our job is to do justice for victims and the community. And one of the most vulnerable communities that we have is the undocumented immigrant community. So let's talk about um, what we do. The Immigrant Affairs Offices, our program, is to investigate and prosecute fraud committed against immigrants and educate the immigrant community and the public about fraud, immigration fraud, which is why I'm so glad that I'm here today. I mean, many of you probably are like, why is she speaking to us? My position is, the more people who know about the possibilities of fraud, the more aware you are, right, about the resources available. If you know of someone who's fallen prey to an unscrupulous individual who will take advantage of them, <coughs> we want you to know, we want your communities to know, we want you to be able to tell people that there is a resource, that there is help available. Why are undocumented immigrants so vulnerable? They don't speak the language. They usually come from countries where the government is not to be trusted. So they're very unwilling to come forward to the government for assistance because they don't want to get deported or they don't trust the government. Immigrants are also vulnerable, and I can speak about this from my own Chinese background. If you're an undocumented immigrant and you don't have ID, a lot of banks will not allow you to open a bank account. So what are you transacting? Cash, right? So if I'm carrying a lot of cash, if I deal with cash, cash is very, it's untraceable. That makes an undocumented immigrant vulnerable. And finally, the reason why I believe, and I think a lot of advocates believe, why undocumented immigrants are so vulnerable to people who will take advantage of them is because they have this hope, they have this belief that America is a great country, that if they work hard, if they do things right, they can make it here. So when you are so hopeful, when you have so much belief, you'll believe people who will tell you what you want to hear. So the Immigrant Affairs Program in the Manhattan DA's office um, was established by Robert Morgenthau, our prior district attorney, in 2007. Um, in 2010, when the current DA took over, he appointed two of us, me, myself, and um, my, my co-director, Marilyn Rivera. Marilyn speaks 
fluent Spanish, um, and I am um, of Chinese descent and I speak Chinese. So we are there um, to be accessible to the two largest immigrant communities in Manhattan. And although I'm only talking about the Manhattan DA's office, I just want to make clear, you know, all the DA's offices prosecute these types of crimes. They might not necessarily have a program like ours, but they do prosecute these types of frauds. So the fraud that we see the most are individuals or providers who represent themselves and tell the immigrant, I am an attorney. I'm capable. I have the ability to do what you need me to do. But in reality, they're not licensed or accredited. So we'll see this in um, storefronts. They'll say notario, for example. In the Spanish-speaking community, a notario in their country is a higher level lawyer, right? Um, a lawyer with more abilities than the regular lawyer. But here in the United States, an Ontario is a notary public, right? Not even a lawyer. So there is some confusion. We'll see this in storefront travel agencies, for example, as well. Or we'll see this in um, storefront immigration consultant firms, okay? I'm sure most of you guys have seen this as well if you're just walking down some streets. So this is the law that we deal with the most. Um, it's called the unauthorized practice of law. So it pretty much, if you are not a lawyer, you can't practice law. You can't appear in court as an attorney. You can't even give legal advice, all right? But in these co in immigrant communities, we'll have people pretending that they're lawyers. And they'll take thousands of dollars from immigrants. And yet, they'll fill out the wrong forms, or they won't do anything at all. Sometimes it's better for these lawyers to not do anything. Because once an incorrect form is filled out, you jeopardize that immigrant and you put them at risk for deportation. So I just want to go over some of the cases that we've um, worked on in the past. OK, so this is one of my first cases when I um, came to the, um, the program. So the People versus Jennifer Lamb. And we'll go through some of the red flags, right, that immigrants and just regular people should always be aware of when we're seeking services. So my victim found this defendant on Craigslist. <laughs> yeah, OK, I know we laugh, but it happens. OK, it happens repeatedly. But that is a red flag. She claimed she went to Stanford Law School and that she went to Notre Dame. A great schools, great pedigree. She said she was a lawyer. Um, and her law office was in her house, which is also a red flag. Over the course of a couple of months, she really befriended this victim and promised him that she could take care of all of his paperwork. I mean, she not only took money, but she made this victim fill out pages and pages of forms. And he had to gather so much materials, not only from the United States, but back home in China. I mean, he put together pictures, he put together letters of references. A lot of time was spent for this application. In this case, though, Jennifer Lamb asked our victim for money orders. She said, I'll take care of your filing fees. Give me $14,000 in money orders. Don't worry. Leave it blank. I'll fill it out. So he trusted her. She had befriended him for months. He had, she had made it seem like she could take care of everything for him. And of course, he trusted her. So what do you think happened? Nothing was filed. And when I subpoenaed the bank records, when I subpoenaed these money orders, fortunately, he was very organized. Do you think that these money orders were written out to the Department of Homeland Security for filing fees? No. Who did you think that the payee was? Jennifer. Jennifer Lamb. Every single money order was written out to her. So she was arrested, and she pled guilty to the unauthorized practice of law in Grand Larceny. Two things about this case. I knew that there were other victims. But none of them wanted to come forward. So I had to go forward on one, with one victim. And we were willing to do that because 
we, all, we had all the evidence. The other victims, though, didn't want to come forward because they were scared. And that is a reality that we in law enforcement have to deal with constantly. After she was arrested in New York and served her time in New York, she actually got sent back um, and extradited to Nevada, where she was wanted there as well. And I recently did a search, um, and I found her mugshot, actually, because she's been rearrested in Texas. OK. <laughs> so all right, so this is another example, Victor Espinal. He was a very well-known member of the Dominican community in Washington Heights. He actually was a consultant on Univision, which is one of the largest um, Spanish-speaking television stations. So very, very well-respected, very high profile. But he was not licensed to practice law. He promised his victims green cards, visas, and citizenship. He took the money, and he failed to deliver on his promises. OK, so this was someone that the community trusted. Right? Not just one person <coughs> on Craigslist trusted, but someone on, in the community. He also pled guilty to the unauthorized practice of law. So now we're getting into the nitty gritty a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of skim through this. Something else that we see, it's called immigration service providers. These are not lawyers. All right? These are storefronts, and we see them just walking in immigrant communities where they call themselves immigrant service providers or immigration consultants, all right? They are not lawyers, but they're cheaper. And they're in the community because they have that storefront. So a lot of immigrants will go to these immigration service providers not knowing that these are not lawyers, not knowing that they're not accredited, OK? So there's very limited um, things that immigration service providers can do. But what can they do? Pretty much, they can translate, make copies, write down what the client or the immigrant tells them, get documents, make appointments for fingerprinting, and make referrals to real lawyers. But we see immigration service providers who are not lawyers committing immigration fraud and defrauding immigrants as well. OK, so this is another example. Rafael Masso. He worked out of Washington Heights. Here he told the victims that he was an immigration agent, okay? And he had a revolver, he had a shield. So just put yourself in an immigrant's shoes, right? If you're with a federal agent, you're going to be a little scared, but you're going to kind of trust him too. So he said that um, he could help people look up their status, and he would have a computer, and he would just type things into the computer, um, and he would have them sign immigration per paperwork. It turns out, though, that he was not employed by the government, and these victims paid him thousands of dollars, and they got nothing in return. He was arrested and sentenced to prison time. Okay? I'll also tell you another story. This is one of the other cases that I prosecuted. Um, this was in the Nepali community. Um, my defendant, the person who was arrested told people in her community that she was related to the Prime Minister of Nepal. Okay. The Prime Minister was coming to New York to speak at Columbia University. And as part of the Prime Minister's entourage, she could bring, um, she could invite people to join that entourage. So she asked immigrants who had arrived even um, more recently than her, so people who really trusted her, that if you give me $7,000 a piece, I can add you on to the prime minister's entourage. Now, these victims really trusted her because she had been there, she had been in the US longer, she had invited them to her home, she had actually given some of them jobs, okay, in the nail salon. So they trusted her. She was like a big sister. All right, she invited them for all the Nepali festivals and holidays. So it turns out for this case, I had to reach out to the prime minister's wife. <laughs> are you related to this person? It turns out, of course, they were not related. Okay, so I mean, these are just kind of the examples of fraud that we see.
as father mentioned, there is a lot of dialogue right now in DC about comprehensive immigration reform. Nothing is set in stone yet, right? There's no law, there's no new law, there are no new rules, um, there's no amnesty, but there's a lot of confusion, right? The Senate has voted, but the House has to vote. I mean, who knows what's going on? But in times of confusion, individuals who want to exploit the immigrant community will come out. And we saw that um, a couple years ago. Do you guys remember the big Haitian earthquake? Yes. OK. So during that time, the US government um, allowed for Haitians in the US um, who were undocumented to stay. They were given temporary protective status, OK, because they couldn't go back home. So what this defendant did was um, Mark Payan, he was a volunteer at the United Nations. He had a little table in the lobby, and he told Haitian victims that um, his position at the UN gave him access to obtain TPS for them. So he worked in the UN. He had a little table there. Why wouldn't you believe him, right? I mean, he had the credibility, I guess, of, um, of the UN behind him. He scammed over 10 people. Each of them gave him several hundred to a couple thousand dollars. And to us, a hundred dollars, maybe not so much money, a thousand dollars, it's a lot of money, but okay, we'll make it back. But if you think about the work that undocumented immigrants do in our city, they're dishwashers, they're cab drivers, they're cleaners, they're maids, they're nannies, they work in nail salons. This is blood, sweat, and tear money. $100 to them is a lot of money. And it was scammed, just like that. He decided to go to trial and was convicted. OK. So when we talk to victims, when we talk to the community, we want everyone to be aware. These are the possible indications of fraud, not just an immigration fraud, but I mean, for us, everyday life, OK? Cash was demanded. In so many of our cases, we see that the unscrupulous individual demands cash. As I told you before, cash, you know, it's, it's traceable, but it's just not as easy to trace as money orders or checks or wires, OK? But a lot of our cases, cash was demanded. No receipt was provided. A lot of these individuals, our victims, said, we gave him money, but we asked for a receipt, and he wouldn't give it to us, or she wouldn't give it to us. So that's always a concern. If this is a legitimate business, if this is a real lawyer, why wouldn't they offer you a real receipt? The client was asked to sign blank documents or documents that they, don't, they did not understand. Very often, we'll ask, when we're trying to figure out where the crime has occurred, or what exactly happened, we'll ask the victim, so what exactly were you applying for? Because if that person did not qualify for that, that's, you know, it makes it easier for us to determine that there was a crime. And more often than not, these victims will come in and say, I have no idea. What do you mean you have no idea? What was this person's name? They'll have no idea. Oh, he was his first name. I just remember his first name. Or I don't even remember where the office was. Or they changed their telephone number. Um, but I definitely don't know what I signed. I mean, he's the lawyer. He should know. I trusted him. All right? So, and then copies are not provided. Well, obviously, copies are not going to be provided if the forms you were filling out were not legit. Right? So, and finally, possible, another possible indication of fraud is atypical practice by the provider. So we talked about um, the home office, right? Which is not as strange as the mobile office, the guy who operates from his car, or the guy who operates from <coughs> McDonald's. Yes, I mean, you guys are looking at me like, what? But it happens, because we've seen it. Um, so this is the end of my presentation. Um, we give out our hotline. Um, how this works is if a victim feels like they've been defrauded, they can call our hotline. We have multilingual paralegals answering the phone so that they can try to figure out where we can direct them. Um, you know, it's answered during business hours, and 
everyone is welcome to call if there are tips we you know we'll take them um, but this is how the program works we have paralegals and we have attorneys working on th these cases but we could not be um, as effective as we are without the assistance and the help of the community all of you being aware that this happens People like Father Brian, who are advocates for immigrants, who can hold their hand throughout this process, because it is scary. You know, being involved, being tangled with the criminal justice system, as a victim even, is very scary. Um, so people like Father Brian, who will walk them through, you know, hold their hands while they come and meet with us, or meet with um, the ICE agents. All of you are integral to what we are trying to do in protecting the immigrant population of New York. So I want to thank you guys today for being so attentive. Um, it's so great to be on a college campus. Um, I hope that this was helpful and this was interesting to you. I hope many of you, some of you, will consider a career in law enforcement. Um, being a prosecutor, I have to say, is so professionally satisfying. Every single day, I leave work knowing that I made my community a little better, a little bit safer. Um, every day is very different, um, and it is a great job. You don't get paid as well as you would in the private sector, but the satisfaction you get from doing justice and doing the right thing, um, you, you can't really put money to that. So I hope you will consider um, this as a very noble profession. I want to thank you guys again for your attention.